It's my pleasure to introduce to Sabina Mihe, who is a professor of media and cultural analysis in, at uh, Loughborough University in the UK, and who works in the fields of comparative media research, television studies, and cultural Cold War. Among her numerous publications, I would like to mention two books, Media Nations, Communicating Belonging and Exclusion in the Modern World, and Central and Eastern European Media in Comparative Perspective, Politics, Economy, Culture. Uh, co-written with uh, John Doney. And her most recent project, funded by Leverhulme Trust, offers the first systematic transnational study of media under communist rule. Sabine is just in the end of running this uh, several years of very intensive and broad uh, research project, and I'm sure that we hear some of this uh, uh, findings also in the findings in the um, presentation she's about to make. The title of the of her talk is "Approaches to Television and Nationalism: Cross-Country Comparison, Longitudinal Analysis, Popular Culture, and Audience Research." Please. Thank you, Oksana. Does this work? Yeah. Um, well, thank you first of all to the organizers for inviting me to this event, and I would also like to con congratulate. Um, this group on the project. I think it's fascinating, um, well, first of all, that you have these materials to start with, and also th that you have decided to make them more visible, for, both for the academic, but also for the artistic community and the community of practitioners. So I do really hope that um, we end up with some good ideas for where to take this in the future. Um, um, also, selfishly, I think it's quite a good point for me to be thinking about these things because, as Oksana says, I'm working currently on a big project, which, however, is about to be completed by the end of this year. Um, and I'm, I am at a stage when I'm thinking, well, where do I go next? So I'm hoping that some of the materials that you do have here in these archives might form part of some of my future work um, as well. So I'll... Um, I decided actually to start with a few basic thoughts and then take these thoughts as a sort of prelude to thinking about some of the research projects I was involved in over the past, well, 15 years or even more, so it feels quite a long time away. So I've been working um, on things that have to do with either television, and in particular television broadcasts, or nationalism uh, for, well, almost two decades now. Um, and I never probably properly stopped <laughs> uh, to think, well, how has my work changed since then? And what kind of lessons can I take from that and possibly share with others as well? So I'm, I'm kind of trying this, to do this as well today. So um, starting with the basics, when we think about media nationalism, where do we actually begin? Um, and I think no matter who we are, whether we are social scientists or just lay observers, we tend to start with the media themselves and ask, well, what do the media do to society? And in the question of nationalism, we might be tempted to ask, well, how do the media instigate nationalism in society? So we instinctively treat media as a cause. I think that's a sort of, a, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction that we all have, no matter how long we have actually worked in the media, funnily enough. But there's a different approach to the same dynamic, which I think is equally, if not even more important, and that's to ask, well, what does society do with the media? Or, in the case of nationalism, how is it and why that the media have become nationalist in the first place? And I don't think we can actually adequately answer either of the two questions without acknowledging them both. Um, and this is, you know, in part of the story that I think Ildiko has been uh, telling us as well in her presentation, the importance of situating the media and the particular broadcasts we're interested in, in the broader environment, in the broader context, and really understand the whole dynamic and how it operates. So in the second question, we're really treating media also as a consequence, uh, as a consequence of particular decisions of political elites, regulators, media owners, but also as a consequence of how media audiences, no matter how limited their freedom actually is, use uh, media in particular ways, reject them, ignore them sometimes, uh, you know, even if that's naive. Uh, but that's an important part of the story um, as well. And we can break these questions down further and ask, well, when, you, when we talk about the media, which media then? Uh, and why television in our case today? Or why even news broadcasts? Because that's not uh, an immediate 
a self-evident self answer. We might be tempted again to think immediately of news when we think about media nationalism. But there are, as I'll try to show, there are other types of broadcasts that might be, well, they are equally important, if not in some cases even more important in understanding the story uh, of media and society and nationalism. And in relation to society, likewise, what kind of, which aspect of society are we thinking of? Political elites, media owners, producers, audiences, all the different groups have a stake in creating the dynamics of media nationalism. Now, I know these are quite basic thoughts, but I don't know how you do things, as a uh, those of you who are researchers. Once you get engrossed in the particular details of the project, I think we do tend to forget about the broader picture sometimes. So I think it's useful to um, get back a little bit. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that TV broadcasts or the TV news broadcasts that you have in, in these wonderful archives are just one part of a much larger story of media and nationalism. And the challenge for us as researchers, I think, is to establish, first of all, what is the role of these broadcasts in the larger story that we're trying to tell, and maybe even before that, what, what is the story that we're trying to tell, actually? And then how do we go about using those broadcasts to tell the story in the most effective way? Um, and now to give you some answers, I'll briefly go through, I'll review three projects um, that I worked on over the past 15 years or so that have all to do either with nationalism or with television or, or with both of them. And I'll try to tease out some of the lessons that uh, I've learned through all of them collectively. And if I have some time at the end, I might not. Uh, I forgot to time this, actually. Um, uh, I might tell you a little bit about uh, some of the ideas that I'd like to explore in the future um, as well. So starting with the first project, which is actually my PhD, so that is really a long, long time away. Um, this project actually is one of those projects that I would probably never do again. Why? Because it mostly consisted of me analyzing media content and media texts, television and press. Um, I did adopt a longitudinal approach, uh, meaning that I looked actually at developments over time, which I think is a very good thing, as you'll see. Um, I focused on one country alone, the country I lived in at that point, Slovenia. Uh, I've selected three points in time, uh, three periods, three events, to investigate how uh, um, mostly mainstream media were involved in reframing uh, the meanings of the Slovenian nation in this context, vis-a-vis -vis events such as the uh, establishment of an independent uh, country, and then later on vis-a-vis -vis various waves of uh, migration. And interestingly, the wave of unregistered migration in 2000, 2001 provoked reactions in the media that were quite similar to the ones that we're seeing today, so I find it quite fascinating how these things still keep repeating themselves. So what I did was I analyzed a vast range of materials using mostly qualitative materials looking at the dynamics of the self and the other, so how us Slovenians were represented vis-a-vis -vis other, uh, uh, different others. Uh, I was particularly keen to understand the logic of symbolic geographies in the process, by which I mean notions such as Europe, East, West, the Balkans, all of which were very Im imbued with negative and positive values. Uh, and also I was looking at the use of metaphors. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details, so just to give you a sense of what I was doing here. Visuals were important as well, as was music, things such as, you know, why, why, why would you all of a sudden in the middle of a news bulletin use uh, a slightly orientally sounding music when you're talking about migration? Yeah, and that was the only item, just to give you a sense. Second project was one I worked uh, on in conjunction with uh, a colleague in Slovenia, Veronika Bajt, and a colleague in uh, Serbia, Miloš Pankov. And we embarked here on a comparative project looking at TV broadcasts produced in Slovenia and Serbia. So uh, two republics later, uh, two, two separate countries. Um, over the course of the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, and again, we were looking at how uh, the sense of belonging was reframed in this process through television. But unlike the previous project, I at least became much more interested here in how the reframing of this course on the screen um, was conditioned or connected with the dynamics in the political elites. So I was quite interested to see how, for instance, the, the, the change from um, 
a, a situation where the political elites felt that um, certain issues were open to legitimate controversy and coincided with a point in time where also in the media you could see quite a diversity of opinions. And then as soon as police, uh, political elites agreed on a topic um, and agreed that, say, in this case, uh, Slovenia should be called, become independent or during the war in particular, um, the, the media then followed suit and also homogenized their discourses. Yeah, so that they were, they were talking with the same voice and adopting the position of uh, the media and the nation. Um, and I'll skip the methodological part in this case. Um, and finally, my third project, which is the one I'm still working on and I'm very much engrossed in now, is a very different one from the two that I was just describing, in the sense that here television broadcasts and in particular news are a very minimal part of the story. Um, it's a comparative study of uh, developments in television over five countries uh, during the Cold War, starting roughly in the mid-50s and going up to the, 99, uh, to the end of the Cold War, effectively. One of these countries is Yugoslavia, but there are, as you can see from the map, other countries as well, Soviet Union, Poland, East Germany, Romania. Uh, and apart from the programs, uh, we also analyzed archival sources, we analyzed schedules to, to get a sense of where these programs were located, and we conducted a wealth of oral history interviews to understand how actually uh, people uh, interacted with television in their everyday lives in the different uh, countries. And two things I'd like to emphasize here is that um, we decided in this pro project with my researchers to include popular genres as a particular focus, so not just news, and to look really closely at audience use and reception as an important part of the story. And this is part of the larger aim that is my, my goal to kind of shift in media and communication studies attention from research on media systems to what I call media cultures. So really the dynamic of uh, creating meaning uh, at the interaction between um, audiences audiences, media text, and producers, rather than the dynamics of how the political systems influence um, the media. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you a couple of examples of the sort of stuff that we've been doing in this project, all the examples here are from Yugoslavia. Um, some of the things that we were analyzing included um, popular television series from the era, so we were looking both at television series that depicted history and try to understand how uh, the nature of depictions of history and the uses of memory during communism uh, related to particular political changes in the t at the time, both domestically and internationally, as well as in development in, sort of, in the global television business, because um, although we might think of uh, socialist television as being isolated from transnational currents, it certainly wasn't. And on the other hand, we looked at a television series about everyday life, family life, and again tried to understand how these depictions of everyday life and squabbles between um, parents and children and um, husbands and wives or workers in a workplace were an important part of how and why um, uh, political systems in Eastern Europe at the time functioned as, as they did. Another important part of what we were doing was trying to recreate the domestic cultures of television. Uh, everything from how television as a material object entered the home, um, how the routines of everyday life got adapted around it, how it became part of the material surrounding in the home, um, as well as to bring this to the present, we were trying to understand now how people today remember these experiences of everyday life with television. And that's, I think, also quite, quite important uh, to understand. Okay, so to sum up, because I only have a few minutes left, what do I think worked best in all these projects? First of all, comparative analysis. Um, I'm quite keen on that. Uh, so doing cross-country comparisons as well as cross-media comparisons. And one of the benefits there it relates exactly to one of the questions that the organizers raised in the program when we got it for the first time, and that is how to deal with bias. Well, comparison is one of the ways in which you can clearly see bias quite easily and then leads you directly into questioning, well, where do these differences then come from? Yeah? Why such a bias in one place and not in another? Uh, longitudinal analysis, so developments over time, understanding continuities and changes over time, uh, and again, 
I think also longitudinal analysis has the benefit of pushing us to uh, really explain why things happen in the way they did and why they differ in different places. So why does television represent things in different ways uh, at different points in time? Another thing, audience research. So again, I know there's a big challenge to conducting audience research historically, but I think that in our project we demonstrated that that's actually still possible. Um, it, it involves acknowledging audience agency um, and the wider context in which the media texts are actually placed and received. And I think what's really important here is also that it helps us realize um, whether we actually manage to choose the right media text to start with, to study. We may, you know, you know we may spend hours and hours studying a, a news broadcast, but was this actually a program that audiences watched? Was this the program that, you know, um, help them understand the world or interact the world in a particular way? Probably not, or maybe not. Um, and finally, popular genres, um, which I think are important in understanding nationalism um, uh, because, they, because nationalism is not only politics. It's also part of news and entertainment. And I think television programs that are from these genres can actually help us understand how, telev how television can help not necessarily establish, but certainly sustain momentum, the momentum of nationalist attachments once they are there. And they may be even more effective than news in some cases. Challenges I encounter accessibility. So archives such as this one that you have here is obviously a, a great help. Uh, case selection, which countries, which media, which genres, I still you know, wrestle with that. Uh, I, I also increasingly think that to understand developments in Yugoslavia, we need to sometimes go beyond Yugoslavia. Um, and compare, you know, perhaps developments, transitional developments in other countries, and contextualization. So how do we, using what sources do we contextualize TV broadcasts best? Is it archives, is it, is it oral history, is it something else? And, I and I'm sure these are some of the questions that the archivists here have been uh, engaging with as well. Uh, do I have time for future ideas at all? One minute? Yeah? Okay, so very quickly. Um, I'll just say broadly that I'm interested in the relationship between media and social change. And I know that might, might sound as something that everyone who does media is interested in. Um, but to be honest with you, once you start looking at what do we actually do as media scholars to understand change over time, you will quickly realize that our methodologies are quite problematic. Because I don't think we actually manage to find a way to, in a way, prove that the media contribute to social, social change. Uh, and by, by this I mean that uh, we, we are still not having a good sense of how do we establish whether the media actually act only as an instrument in the hands of the elites, let's say, in which case why do we even study the media? We can just go to the elites and ask them. Uh, or are there actually moments when the media act as at least a semi-independent agent of change? And how do we establish that? And under what, what conditions do the media act as an independent cause of change? Um, and I would quite like to use some of the Yugoslav materials and post-Yugoslav materials as uh, one of the ways of entering this, um, uh, this question. And the other two I'll just briefly mention. One has to do with media events in social change, again, so transformative media events and the relationship between media, social change, and memory. So how are the media involved in remembering and understanding social change retrospectively? Um, well, thank you very much. In case you're interested in my current project, there's also a website where you can find much more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you.